I hope it comes as no surprise that today we are looking at Luke chapter 8, the parable of the sower. And we might have made it to the end today. When a great crowd was gathering and people from town after town came to Him, Jesus said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And he said these things. He called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while and in time of testing fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked out by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. Their fruit does not mature. But as for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and they bear fruit with patience. Today we're talking about what it takes to be the good soil. The good soil that is capable in the hands of God of producing a lifetime of fruit. As I read the passage, I come up with with basically two points. Since everybody's worried about the snow, it's a two-point sermon, we'll get out of here quick. (laughs) Probably not, because I'm playing football too. Jesus says, in essence, two things in the passage. Uh, If you want to be good soil, you have to hold fast to the Word of God, and you have to bear fruit. Possibly a hundredfold. With patience, of course. We'll get to the patience in a minute. But this hold fast has really had me captivated. It didn't at first. Uh, I, I, in fact, this sermon just sort of changed a lot over the course of the week. But when I read those words, hold fast, I, I thought of a couple movies where some kid was a running back and he, it, he kept fumbling the ball. And, and I was going to show a little video clip, but I never could find one that was suitable for our audience. But they would make these kids carry the football around with them in school. And of course, after about five minutes, it became a, a, a funny thing, didn't it, Robin? And what do all his friends do? Yeah, I guess. That's not holding fast the Word of God, uh, or the football for that matter. And so by the end of that first day, the kid had a football, and you could have beat him with a baseball bat, but he would have died holding on to that football. That's kind of the the image at first I get when it comes to, to thinking about holding fast. Apostle Paul says to do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the Word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. And that was my... We need to take hold of the Word of God. And we need to run through life and we need to... Walter Payton. Nobody's knocking that ball out of Walter Payton's hand. but, But inevitably it always happened. Somebody did. Uh, Barry Sanders. Nobody's getting the ball. But but inevitably, it always happened. I mean, the Super Bowl last week, it was won on a fumble, wasn't it? You know, a guy gets paid a kajillion dollars to hold, hold fast the ball. And in the first couple of minutes, it was knocked right out of his hands. The game was over, in essence. Hold fast the Word of God. Well, 
I started looking at the verbiage here and, and hold fast. It, it took on some new meaning. I, I went and, and I, I went back to see what the Hebrew word for that was, and I'm not going to tell you because you don't really want to know that. But but we find it used when when Moses brings the the second set of the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel. And he says that he he instructs the people there who are gathered, you shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve Him and hold fast to Him. And by His name and His name alone shall you swear, He is your praise, He is your God, who has done for you these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen. Life all of a sudden is in this action of holding fast to God Himself, to to cling to God, and and in God find your life. This changes a little bit. It's a little bigger than football now, wouldn't you say? And I I move on to Isaiah chapter 56, and and it's just an example. It's not like the only other place you find this, but, but Isaiah, he said, thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness, for soon my salvation will come. And my righteousness will be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, and the Son of Man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and keeps his hand from doing any kind of evil. We're starting to see that this hold fast is a lifestyle that God is trying to get His children to engage in. To hold fast to Himself and to nothing. It's a little bigger than football. It's Well... Prophet Jeremiah comes on the scene and God is not necessarily happy with the way that that his prized possession have been behaving. In fact, he says they've turned the table from what he's been saying all along. Jeremiah's voice says, You shall say to them, thus says the Lord, When men fall, do they not rise again? If one turns away, does he not return? Why then has this people turned away in perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. I've paid attention and I've listened, but they've not spoken rightly. No man relents of his evil saying, What have I done? Everyone turns to his own course like a horse plunging headlong into battle. Instead of the children of Israel clinging on to the hand of God, instead they've clinged... Clinged, is that the right verb? Clung? Is clung a word? Instead of taking hold of God, they've taken hold of the garbage of life and of their own wickedness and of their own evil, and they are not letting go of that. Their lifestyle has done a complete turn. Well, hold fast. If you want to be good soil, you've got to hold fast to the Word of God. Well, it gets interesting. Because here's where I really had my eyes opened, is to see what we're dealing with. When Jesus says to hold fast, what's the context He's speaking in? He answered, Have you not read that He who created them from the beginning made them male and female. And he said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now holding fast is bigger than a football. I mean, it's, it's the marriage union that, that God has created and put out there. I, I think about when we were just about to get married. This would be funny. <laughs> it lets you see a side of bird that you probably don't ever get to see. I, I was a youth leader in Nashville, and we decided that we were going to take a, a whitewater rafting trip. And and so we we made reservations. I had all my leaders and all the kids to go to the Ocoee River over in East Tennessee where they ended up making a, an Olympic kayaking event right there where we were going. This is not going on a trip down the Little Wabash or the Skillet Fork. Well, my adult lady, the last minute she backs out. And all I've got is Bert. I said, Bert, she's up here getting ready for our wedding in a week. I said, Bert, I really need you to go with me on this trip. I don't have an adult 
female counselor. She said, I can't leave. We're, we're, we're. I said, hey, this, is, this is what our life's going to be like. So you might as well just start today. Come on. Agree. Come with me. Be my lady counselor. She said, okay, I'll do it. So she drives down to Nashville, I think, and, and we take a and we go to the Ocoee River and we get there late and we, we check into this lodge and, and in the morning we wake up and we go to the rafting place and they give out helmets. And she looked at me like, what? I thought we were going to go boating. <laughs> and this girl is our, our leader. And she's got ta- nothing wrong with tattoos. Okay, I just want to say that. At least, anyhow. Let's not even start there. She's covered in tattoos and and she goes to load the raft up on top of this bus and she's got the hairiest armpits I have ever seen. (laughs) And her arms are this big around and she's a beast. And and she's going to be our leader and I actually felt really safe with her. And and we're in the bus and we've had safety lessons and all of this and, and, and everything's okay. But we pull down this little access road and and the bus comes around a corner and out from the brush we see the river. And Bert says, I ain't going. (laughs) I mean, the rapids are insane. And she says, there ain't no way I'm getting out there in that water. That's terrifying to me. And I said, you've got to do this. I mean, you have to. There's no... You have to. I have to have a lady there. Okay. And we, we, we carry our raft up to the edge of the river. And I'll never forget. She turned and she grabbed me by the shirt and the life jacket. And she twisted a little so it's choking. <laughs> and I started to get red and she said, Don't you dare let me fall out of this boat. <laughs> I got you, baby. I'll hold fast. Okay, we weren't married yet. So the two hadn't become one and all of that. So when the rubber hit the road and the raft hit the rapids, it was every man for himself. (laughs) And within a matter of a hundred yards from our bus, she is out of the boat, under the boat, and I didn't know if she was ever coming back. Finally... I was going to say Big Bertha, but that wouldn't be right. Big Edna. She grabs a hold of Bert and she pulls her out from under the boat and flops her over in and there, there she is. And I mean, already, she's got a bruise down her hip that's about this big. And it's black as coal. And she said, the wedding is off. <laughs> It's Valentine's Day, and we're still here, and God took care of me. But, but I didn't hold fast. And a couple of weeks ago, I, I, as a, it's in the context of marriage, what it's like to hold fast, I came across a picture that Tyler Spradling put on Facebook. And, and I guess it's why I just emotional train wreck this morning, because it's a picture that shows what what it is for a man to hold fast to his wife. This is his grandma's first night in an assisted living facility. And that's his grandpa after 60 some odd years of marriage spending the night laying on the floor holding her hand. The good soil holds fast to the Word of God in a good heart, an honest heart. Is this descriptive of your relationship to the Word of God? Because if it's not, I would question the goodness of your soil. This It's what it means to hold fast for all times and forever until death do us part. If it kills me, I will still hold fast. 
See, we like to be little scripture people and we like little t-shirts and bumper stickers and, and we put little calendars up and we'll take one verse at a time when it's cute because it sounds nice and it looks great on a shirt and on our little cards. But the reality is for a lot of us, we don't hold very fast to God's Word. Number two, to bear fruit a hundredfold with patience. Now, Jesus said Himself, If you abide in Me, My Word abides in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done. By this My Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be My disciples. If you are holding fast to the Word of God, then bearing fruit only, that, that, that's the only option. That's what comes next. That's the end result of holding fast to the Word of God because God has said, My Word goes out from My mouth. It shall not return to Me empty, but it will accomplish that which I purpose. It shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. If we are holding fast to the Word of God and it is alive in us, we will bear fruit. We will accomplish what God desires to accomplish in us. Simple question. Are you bearing any fruit that will last? Because that's, that's what happens That's what's expected. That is necessary if you are good soil. If you don't desire to be good soil, then don't worry about it. But if you do desire to be good soil, you cannot help but to produce fruit. You can talk about it all you want. You can say it all you want, but the world will know whether or not it's real. And that is if you're bearing fruit. Now, If you're not bearing fruit, I would say go back to the holding fast part and start again. But what I I like in this last little bit is the yield. Jesus says that you will yield a hundredfold with patience. Meaning, literally, uh, in essence, what, what, what He says is over the course of our lifetimes, in the hands of God Himself, as we hold fast to Him and to His Word, the fruit that He can produce is limitless over the course of our lives. Lim- not a hundred percent, a hundredfold. There's a big difference. hundred percent is one for one. hundredfold is one to a hundred yield. I showed you my gardening experience last week and I showed you all I know about gardening and my history as a gardener. I don't know about these yields and all of that. That something lives and doesn't die is miraculous enough for me in the realm of gardening. But, I'm pretty convinced if a guy can get a hundredfold yield, he's going to be pretty thrilled about that as a farmer. Am I correct? Farmers? With patience. Ah, there's where it kicks in, the patience part. Is that, see, we are not capable of producing the fruit. God is the one who produces it through us and in us. And so we have to allow God to take all the time that He desires to do that work in us. Which means we don't have a quota. We don't get to reach a spot and quit. We don't get to say, I've done my part. When when who knows, the part that God desires to do in us might be three times, a hundred times what we could possibly hope for ourselves. So today, with the snow falling down and gardens are a thing of tomorrow, I just would ask, as Jesus says, about the good soil, that it grew, it yielded a hundredfold. He talks about the meaning of His parable. He's talking about those who who hear the Word of God, hold it fast in an honest and good heart. They bear fruit with patience. 
In those two sentences, is Jesus describing you? And if so, then hallelujah and amen and way to go and we're right on it. And there's nothing wrong with being able to say, I'm getting it right. I mean, a lot of times we like to beat ourselves up when it's unnecessary. God wants us to get it right and some of us are getting it right and it's okay that we're getting it right. It's good. But if we're not, what does it take for us to become good soil? What would it take for you? Let's pray. God, today, we're thankful that You have such high expectations for us because that implies unlimited potential in Your hands. God, we're concerned that You have such unlimited potential for us because we know how far short we're capable of falling. And yet You don't tell us to do it on our own. You've already given us the secret and the key and and all of that, and I guess it's no secret that if we remain in You and Your Word remains in us, then we can do it to Your standards. So Father, today I I pray that we might be a people willing willing to be made good soil. That the harvest You set before us might, uh, might be produced in us through Your efforts and Your work. that we would be useful to You, O God. Again, for the day, we give You thanks. In Christ's name, we ask it. Amen.